Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you uh, to our program this evening through the Champaign County Master Gardeners. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, is Dr. Carrie Havens. She holds a BS and an MA in botany from Southern Illinois University and a PhD in biology from Indiana University. She spent three years as the conservation biologist at Missouri Botanical Garden before joining the Chicago Botanical Garden in April of 1997. She is currently the garden's senior director of ecology and conservation and senior scientist. Her research interests include the effects of climate change on plant species, restoration genetics, pollution networks, and invasion biology. She is on the faculty of the Loyola University, Northwestern University, and the University of Illinois, Chicago. She chairs the Non-Federal Co Cooperators Committee of the Plant Conservation Alliance, is active in plant conservation accuracy and with elected officials and collaborates with a variety of academic institutions, agencies, and stewardship organizations to help improve Converse, 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 conversation effects for plants and plant communities. And thank you so much for coming today, Dr. Havens. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be with you tonight. I wish it could be in person, but uh, I guess we're all getting used to, to this way of communicating. Um, I will, let's see, maybe. My screen has frozen. Isn't that great? <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about a lot of different conservation efforts that the garden is undertaking uh, with our partners throughout the Midwest and um, beyond. And I'll probably give this talk in about four parts and pause at the end of each part and see if folks have questions. So with that, let me get going. And uh, the first thing I want to share with you is information that we're um, based on research we're doing on ex situ or off-site conservation. This is the kind of conservation that botanic gardens and zoos do. Ex situ simply means um, you're taking an organism outside of its natural habitat and you're doing something to help conserve it in an artificial environment before you return it to the wild. And so this, this is the work that botanic gardens and zoos do. We bring plants and animals into our organizations. We um, do captive breeding and other things, and then we ultimately reintroduce to the wild. And um, this section of the talk, you can see the collaborators that I work with um, at the bottom of the slide. So I wanna start by just giving you a little bit of history about botanic garden conservation. So botanic gardens have been around for a long, long time. Um, earliest ones um, appeared in the 1400s and for the first 500 years or so of our history, uh, we, we, were, um, we were involved in um, simply being a repository of plants for academic study and for medicinal use. And the first time anybody talked about using a botanic garden collection for conservation was uh, about 60 years ago, 1953. Um, and it was a French man, Cugnac, who, who talked about the role gardens could play in conservation. In the 70s, we thought about gardens as arcs, a place where a couple individuals collected in the wild might hang out for a while and ultimately be reintroduced um, back into native habitats. And really in, in more recent decades, say the last 30 to 40 years, we've thought about botanic gardens as having a role in integrated plant conservation so that we are partners throughout the conservation um, process and that we look at species both in the wild um, and in our collections. We are conserving an awful lot of species. About 105,000 species exist in botanic gardens. And this is about a quarter of all the plant species on earth. Um, more than uh, a quarter are also held in seed banks um, around the world. There are roughly 120 or so species that exist only in botanic gardens that are extinct in the wild 
And many of our collections are much bigger than what um, survives in wild populations. We're actively reintroducing rare plants, over 100 in the US um, right now. And we're contributing to the global strategy for plant conservation, the GSPC, um, which is a set of targets uh, that um, all countries around the world need to meet if we're gonna effectively conserve plants. And um, the one about um, seed banking is target eight. And it says that we should have 75% of rare species in our garden collections and 20% of those um, actively being reintroduced. So we're getting close to that. The easiest way to conserve plants offsite at a botanic garden is in, in a seed bank. Um, seed banking is efficient, it's inexpensive. You can hold millions and millions of seeds in a small space. Um, this is our seed bank uh, shown here. <coughs> and we collect seed from about 15 states. Um, the upper Midwest uh, where tall grass prairie once existed. Um, and we're focusing on prairie species, but we're not exclusively banking prairie species. We also um, bank woodland species and wetland species. Right now we have about 1700 species in our bank, about 15,000 accessions, which is a fancy word for collections. Um, so each of those envelopes, foil envelopes you see in the bank is a separate collection um, made from the wild. We focus on species that are important for restoration. And the reason that this is so um, cheap and efficient, um, in addition to seeds being very small, is that they can live a really long time. So most seeds, if we dry them down and we freeze them, um, they can last on average 200 years. So great long-term conservation method. But there's a handful of species, um, about 30%, <coughs> that either don't produce seeds um, or don't produce seeds that withstand drying and freezing. A lot of tropical species fall into this category. Um, we call them exceptional species. Um, but even some temperate species like oaks um, make seeds that can't be frozen. So if you um, freeze an acorn, it will not survive. And um, if you look carefully at the acorns that fall in the, your yard, those that survive germinate in the fall and put down a root um, before you see the shoot the following year. So these exceptional species need some other way, um, some other method of conservation. That could be tissue culture, that could be cryopreservation, or could be holding them in a living collection in a botanic garden. And there are a lot of species that we care about that uh, fall in this category, palms, cycads, avocado, um, and even um, the abroma cacao, the plant that gives us chocolate. So we wanna do, do our best and conserve uh, these species um, for the long term. So when we hold plants in a living collection, they face a lot of risks that they may not um, experience if they were just um, hanging out at a seed bank in a frozen uh, kind of suspended animation condition. Um, when they're living, um, they can hybridize with other species. They can lose genetic diversity. They can adapt to cultivation. They can get sick from pathogens and pests. They might fail to reproduce and even die in collections. So there are a lot of risks that um, we're concerned about in living collections. And so we've turned to um, our colleagues in the zoos because they face many of these same problems. Uh, the animals they can serve don't have handy seeds that can be frozen. So they've been working on these issues for a lot longer than we have. Um, and they cooperatively manage all the animals held in zoos around the world as a single meta population or a big population. And the way they do this is they use um, something called stud books, which tracks the pedigree of every individual held in zoos. And then they use um, population management software to determine which crosses will retain the most genetic diversity possible. And so <clears throat> this software tells you um, 
you know, how to make crosses between different lineages in order to preserve genetic diversity. We've been testing this approach in plants. Uh, the first plant we worked on is the one in the top here. Um, this is Brighamia insignis. Um, it's also called Alula, it's from Hawaii. Um, and some people call it cabbage on a stick and you'll see why when you see a, a side picture of it. Um, but it's extinct in the wild and um, but held at many botanic gardens around the world. Um, we've also tested it on the species below, which you may recognize. This is corpse flower, Amorphophallus titanum. Um, not extinct in the wild, but quite rare and, um, and very difficult to import to countries outside of Indonesia where it's native. And so what we have in collections may be all we ever have in collections and we wanna keep those plants um, healthy and robust. So we have similar conservation goals um, to zoos. We wanna maintain genetic diversity. We want to produce um, new plants that we can use for reintroduction to the wild, um, for display purposes, for education. And, and the zoos have great tools for this. So some of the characteristics we see in um, Brighamia or Alula, um, is that it came from relatively few founders. So when people noticed that it was getting very rare in the wild, and it's a Hawaiian species, it occurs only on the island of Kauai in Hawaii, or did, it's now extinct in the wild. When, when it was recognized how rare it was, there weren't that many individuals left um, to collect seed from and bring into captivity. Um, it's been held in gardens for many generations. It relies on hand pollination. The, one of the reasons it's rare is the pollinator um, that uh, presumably pollinated it. We believe it's extinct. Um, we don't know, we assume it's a moth. Um, <coughs> and our colleagues in uh, Hawaii were noticed that they're noticing that their plants weren't making pollen anymore, um, which suggests that um, they were beginning to become very inbred. So we did a genetic analysis of um, all the plants in botanic gardens around the world. And um, you don't need to, to think um, long and deep about this. The different colors show different genetic lineages. And you can see what was left in Hawaii at the National Tropical Botanic Garden was mostly this lineage shown in, in orange and very little of the lineages in blue and green. But we found the converse on um, US mainland and European and Australian gardens. And so what that told us was there was important genetic diversity held in other parts of the world that could help restore um, fertility to these plants in Hawaii that were um, not producing pollen anymore and uh, make them more robust for ultimate reintroduction. <coughs> so when we did, um, uh, when we use the population management software from zoos, it came up, it's like a, a, a little matchmaker, you know, a dating game thing. Um, and it told us that there was a plant at the Waimea um, Arboretum and a plant held in Switzerland that were the optimal pair um, to restore fertility. And so we crossed those two plants. <coughs> We've been comparing those crosses to to other ones that we've made. Um, we are seeing um, genetic health coming back to the, the plants in Hawaii. And the other thing this, oops, sorry, go back. Um, this program tells us is what individuals are genetically redundant. Um, so they're not contributing to the genetic diversity of the offsite collection. And so those could be used for, um, testing reintroduction, they could be used for research purposes, they could be used for display, but you know, if we lost one, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, other work in this same area was done with um, this species here. This is uh, Oregon Mountain Evening Primrose. It's a rare evening primrose that uh, occurs in New Mexico in a couple of valleys in the Oregon Mountains and nowhere else in the world. And um, my former grad student, Bing Lee, worked on this plant. And she was interested 
And how do plants change when we hold them in botanic gardens for many generations? And she studied this plant because we had a greenhouse colony held at Indiana University since the 1940s for research purposes. And we were able to compare plants coming from the Indiana University population with plants um, that we, or seeds that we collected from the wild. And so we were asking, you know, did multiple generations of hand pollination change um, floral form, floral function in this species? Um, do they differ in things like scent or nectar quality? Um, and what she found out <clears throat> was, yeah, they do. Um, so on these um, graphs, the ones that uh, have uh, multiple stars at the top, are significantly different. So there are three panels um, here that are different and they're different in floral tube length, in style length, and in um, nectar volume. And the plants that had been held in the greenhouse for a long time, um, probably 10 generations or more, had bigger flowers. And that might have been um, uh, unconscious selection uh, on the part of the people that were hand pollinating them. Uh, but they have made less nectar. And so you can begin to see if you try to reintroduce plants um, after this long period of time to the wild, that they might not fare as well as um, uh, plants that were um, being pollinated naturally. So they might not be as attractive to pollinators uh, as the ones from the wild. Another difference she found was uh, phenology or the timing of bloom. So the uh, wild derived plants bloomed um, several days earlier than the uh, greenhouse plants. So the take home message here is that when we hold plants in a botanic garden for many generations, um, they change and they may change in ways that make them less likely to survive when we try to reintroduce them. But there are tools developed by zoos that can help with this. And we are actively working to apply this to um, plants held in collections around the world. So with that, I'm gonna pause for a second. And if there are questions on that part of the talk, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, there is actually uh, one question in the chat box. What moisture do you dry your seeds down to and what temperature do you freeze them at to maintain germination for 200 years? Yeah, so they're um, dried down to about 15% relative humidity. So we put them um, essentially in a box with um, dryerite, a drying agent, um, and let them equilibrate there for about a week. And then we seal them in an airtight foil envelope and they go into the freezer, um, which is a standard freezer temp. It's like minus 18 Celsius, but you could use, you know, before we had a big walk-in freezer, we used a chest freezer we got at Sears. So um, any freezer will do. Um, so those are the conditions, optimal conditions for seed storage. <coughs> Great, thank you. That's that's all in the in the chat box so far, Dr. Hand. All right, um, I'm going to move on and talk about some research that we're doing on rare plants. Um, again, I do this um, with a number of collaborators, and we work up at this incredible site in Door County, Wisconsin. Um, this is the Ship Canal Nature Preserve, and we're studying. Again, with the slides freezing. There we go. We're studying this beautiful plant. <clears throat> you might not find it as beautiful as I do. It is a thistle, um, but it's a rare native thistle and it's uh, really important. So I hope by the end of this section, um, I've swayed you to um, appreciate the wonders of this thistle. Um, this is called dune thistle or pitcher's thistle. Um, Circe and Pitcheri for the Latin folks. Um, and it occurs mainly around Lake Michigan, uh, a couple sites up on Lake Superior and a few over on Lake Huron. 
<clears throat> and it occurs on sand dunes. And so you can oh. see pictures of it here. Um, we call it Sippy for short, um, after Circe and Pitcherai, its um, Latin name. Uh, and we've been working with it for more than 20 years. We've been banking its seed. We've reintroduced it at Illinois Beach State Park. Um, we've done long-term demography at multiple sites, um, looking at um, population trends. Um, and we're trying to understand threats. And right now, the biggest threat to this thistle are biocontrol weevils that were introduced to control weedy thistles, but have decided they like this one better. And because of this, it is being driven to extinction fairly quickly. Um, and we're trying to understand what is its role in the community, the plant community um, and the pollination network and what might happen if we lose this species from the wild. So kind of conventional wisdom has said that um, rare plants can't be important in communities because they're rare. Um, there aren't that many of them, so they can't have a very important role. Um, but Pitcher's thistle is, can be quite abundant where it occurs. And if you know anything about thistles, you know pollinators love them. And um, this species attracts um, an abundance of pollinators. One of the reasons it's so important for pollinators is it blooms at a unique time in the year. So um, on the sand dunes in Wisconsin, we have a, a little mustard, Erebus, that blooms early. Um, and then there's a period of time where there's just pitcher's thistle and nothing else. And then later in the year, we see um, uh, Cetamacrae, which is an invasive species. We get um, common milkweed, we get yarrow, and we get an evening primrose. The numbers um, after the plant name are the numbers of pollinators uh, that we've collected off each species. So you can see um, Pitcher's thistle attracting a lot of different pollinators, more than common milkweed, Asclepius even though we think of it as such an important pollinator plant. And this is a way to look at a plant pollinator network and you don't need to get hung up in the details, but each bar on the bottom here is a different plant and each bar on the top is a different pollinator. And if there are lines connecting them, um, they interact. And so down here is Pitcher's thistle and you can see all the different interactions it has, far more um, than any species, any other species on the dunes. Um, the others that come close are a couple of goldenrods that uh, bloom later in the year. And up here, the most common pollinator we found um, was Bombus impatiens, which is a bumblebee, kind of bumblebee. So we did this same model and said, what would happen if Circeum was not part of the network. And um, so we removed it and we lost um, nine pollinator species. So nine pollinator species in the dune community uh, yeah, I'll be working. would um, disappear without a pitcher's thistle. And I'm gonna move on to ornamental plant or invasive ornamental plants now, but I'll give you a moment if you have any questions about pollinators. Or I see I see in the chat, when you reintroduce plants to the wild, are conditions same um, as when it was taken from the wild? Yeah, great question. It, um, it depends. Uh, and as climate change, uh, gets more and more rapid, it's less and less likely that they're the same. Um, we can use um, kind of climate models to figure out. So if I collect a plant, let's say, say I collected a plant in St. Louis 10 years ago, where are those conditions today? And I can try to match those historic conditions um, with climate envelope models. Um, but yeah, um, the world is changing and the conditions are not always the same. Okay, gonna move on to talking about invasive species. 
Um, a lot of our ornamental plants, our beloved ornamental plants, um, have begun to wreak havoc in the wild. Um, and these can be a very significant threat to rare species and are a big conservation concern. A um, couple of examples that I'm sure you've heard about and are familiar with are burning bush, um, shown in a garden on the left and in the woods on the right, um, and calorie pear, um, again, in, the, in a cultivated setting on the left and coming up in a, I believe that's a highway um, clover leaf where it's uh, taking over. And I'm waiting for, why is it every time I look at the chat, then my slides freeze? That's very interesting. Um, so botanic gardens have this nexus with invasive plants. Um, we do display plants, most of us, um, from all over the world. Um, we are concerned. We don't want to be the entity that um, introduces the next um, buckthorn or um, honeysuckle that, that takes over our woods. Um, and so many gardens have developed policies to be more responsible about what we bring into the country and display. Um, we've signed on to um, what are called the voluntary codes of conduct uh, um, for horticulture and ecology. Um, you can find those online if you're interested. Uh, we have a list of about 150 species now that um, we won't grow at the garden anymore. We're continuously looking um, at what's in our collection and monitoring it to make sure it doesn't become invasive. Um, we uh, support um, all international policies on invasive plants. Um, but one of the things that's really tough to grapple with is um, how do we treat cultivars of invasive species? So if we know burning bush is invasive, and I think that picture demonstrates it fairly well, um, does that mean that all cultivars of burning bush are problematic? Um, and this is something that has come up in horticulture circles again and again. Um, and we know that cultivars differ a lot in the amount of seeds they make. Um, so this is uh, seed set data from barberry, another um, ornament, ornamental that's become invasive. And you can see it, it varies from about 10,000 um, seeds per fruit down to zero. So if we're going to remove a plant from our collection, um, do we just remove the wild type? Or do we remove all the cultivars? Um, and are these uh, putatively sterile cultivars um, always sterile? And I, there was a great example of this a uh, number of years ago where a uh, number of cultivars of um, purple loose strife were marketed as sterile. And it turns out they weren't really sterile, they were self-incompatible, which means if they were all alone in a garden, they wouldn't set seed. But if they were within the distance a bee can fly from another plant, um, they could set seed. And so they weren't truly sterile. So we've been looking at this issue quite a bit. Um, and we wanna be judicious about saying um, you shouldn't grow a plant anymore because of its um, invas invasiveness. And we recognize that um, people have very different opinions of some of these plants. So um, here's barberry again. Um, you look in a nursery catalog and it tells you to grow it. The reasons, sheer growability, hardy to zone four, can take sun or shade, wet or dry, comes back strong after a beating. Whereas um, the Connecticut Botanical Society, where this plant is particularly invasive, calls it the, one of the most destructive plants in Connecticut. And so there's this difference of opinion that, um, that you need to balance and you need to be sure a plant is problematic when you tell the industry they can't grow it or sell it anymore. So we talked a little bit about this, that, um, the industry is concerned about not removing cultivars from their stock. 
um, because they differ um, in seed set. Um, a lot of people, particularly with barberry, which has purple leaf cultivars, will say, um, you know, I only see the green ones in the woods, the purple leaf ones must be safe. Um, these cultivars make a lot of money for the nursery industry. Um, so a couple of points to make about cultivars. You know, the plants themselves don't invade unless they're um, spreading by runners. It's their offspring that invade. And they're off, they may not breed true. And so their offspring may not look like them. And this is the case we're seeing with the per, not seeing purple cultivars, purple foliage being a recessive trait, not seeing purple cultivars in the wild is because they don't breed true. And the offspring of them, um, the seed offspring of purple cultivars is most often green. So we decided to take a look um, at this issue of how cultivars vary from the wild type and how much we would have to reduce seed set to make them safe. And we did this using um, demographic modeling. Um, and in a, in a demographic model, we look at um, birth rates and death rates, and we can predict if a population is growing or declining. And if a population um, is, is at um, a population growth rate of one, that means it's at replacement rate. It's neither growing or declining. If it's greater than one, it's, it's growing and has the potential to become invasive. And if it's declining, it's, it's not something we need to worry about. Um, and that this work was done with Tiffany Knight, um, who's at um, IDIV in Germany. And um, these are um, examples of um, plant life cycles. And the way you read this it, here is you have a seedling and 5% of them become juvenile plants and 80% of juveniles become adult plants. 95% of adults survive to the next year. 5% of juveniles stay juvenile. Um, each adult on average makes a thousand seeds. 10% um, of those germinate. So that's this life cycle. It's hypothetical. But lambda, which stands for population growth rate here, is 1.5. So that is highly invasive. It is um, kind of doubling uh, every, every couple of generations. So this is a plant we would worry about a lot. Just by tweaking a few parameters over here, um, we have a plant where it's at replacement rate. It's neither, the population is neither growing nor shrinking. It's not a plant we would worry about. So what did we tweak? We said um, plants stay juvenile longer. Half of them stay juvenile each year. Um, only 35% of them transition to adults and they make fewer seeds. So in this case, 50 versus a thousand. And so just a few changes and uh, a highly invasive plant can become benign. Good news. So we kind of applied this thinking to um, a number of uh, published uh, demographic models for invasive species that we were able to pull from the literature. And what we found, um, remember lambda equal one here, is the magic line. And so for short-lived um, short species, um, annuals and biennials, you can see you reduce um, seed set down here somewhere around 70 to 80%. If you reduce it by that much, you have um, populations that cross this magic line of one and are no longer a problem. Unfortunately, with longer-lived species, um, we really never get there. With shrubs and trees, you have to be completely sterile to be safe. And so based on these models, we came up with um, a lot of recommendations for the nursery industry. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive, but reducing seed output doesn't result in non-invasive cultivars for long-lived species. Um, if you think about, you know, in order to 
um, have a growing population, a tree needs to produce two offspring that survive. And if a tree lives 100 or 200 years, it has a lot of chances to do that. And that's why um, these long-lived species really need to be sterile if they are um, going to be non-invasive. And for an annual, it's all about the seeds. And if you reduce seeds enough, um, you can uh, make them not problematic. Uh, this demographic modeling approach um, can tell us uh, which cultivars are likely to be problems and which aren't. Um, and it also can tell us what part of the life cycle is most sensitive to change. And that may help us control species. So, you know, for example, if it's that transition between juvenile and adult, um, say with garlic mustard, if you can um, prevent it from sending up those flowering stalks by weed whacking it, you can, you can help solve your problem. So that's some work um, with invasive species. And um, we have a question, any questions? Yes, there is one in the box. Do you work with other countries on what is invasive and do they coordinate with you to remove invasives or to let the public know? We, we work, yes, around the world. Um, now, plants aren't invasive everywhere. So a lot of plants become invasive when they get into a new country. Um, it's uh, called the enemy escape hypothesis that there are things in their native range that kind of keep them in check. But if they can escape those enemies and get to a new place, um, they can become problematic. So, you know, purple loose strife is horrible invasive for us. Um, it's rare in Spain where it's native. Um, I was once at a conference in Spain and uh, they were taking people out to see the threatened purple loose strife. And <laughs> it was comical if you come from our part of the world, but um, so, so plants aren't invasive everywhere. Um, we also do weed risk assessments for anything we bring in from other countries uh, that helps us determine if it's likely to be invasive here. And if it's invasive elsewhere, it's likely to be invasive here. That's one of the things we look at. Okay, last section. <laughs> and how are we doing on time? Okay, we got 20 minutes, we're good. Um, last thing I wanna talk about is uh, research that involves the public. So we have a couple of community science programs um, based uh, on the theory that some kinds of science really need a whole lot of observers to get the kind of data you need to answer questions. And that the more you get people looking at plants and thinking about plants, um, the more likely they are to care about plants and want to conserve plants. So there's kind of a, a dual reason um, for these community science programs. One is educational um, and one is scientific to, to get um, new data. So the first one I want to talk about is Bud Burst. Um, this is a national community science campaign that um, collects data on primarily on um, phenology or when plants um, change from one phase to another of their life cycle. <coughs> so every year, think about a plant, it's gonna leaf out, it's gonna flower, it's gonna fruit, it's gonna drop its leaves or die back. Um, and the, the timing of these events is linked to climate. And so by listening to how plants are changing their phenology, we can infer things about climate change. Um, and we can also begin to understand how they may respond to future climate change. Um, so here, oops, two there. Um, with bud burst, uh, we believe that um, if you see plants, you'll want to save plants, um, that bud burst can inspire conservation ac action and can grow a community of plant scientists. And again, we're interested in phenology. So the timing of life cycle events um, and shown here is a, a maple and you can see it um, flowering and beginning to fruit and in full fruit um, and uh, fruit ready to drop in that last um, branch. 
And the great thing about bud burst is you can do it with any plant at any place at any time. <laughs> and so you can monitor a plant in your garden, um, in your park, in your schoolyard. Uh, you can do it with class groups. Um, you can do it with um, community groups. And there are two ways to participate. Um, one are these phenology observations, and that could be um, a series that you do watching the same plant throughout the entire growing season, or it could be a one-off, you know, you're off um, hiking in your favorite park and you notice something in bloom, you can um, take a photo of that plant and submit it to us um, and tell us what it's doing. You can also participate in research projects and I'll tell you about um, our pollinator research project in a moment. So um, Budburst has uh, been a program for a number of years. We have people in all 50 states participating. Um, these numbers are a bit old. I think we're up to over 20,000 participants now. <clears throat> we recently updated our website and produced a mobile app. So you can um, go either to uh, the Apple Store or um, the Android equivalent and download this app. Um, super easy to make an observation. You snap a photo. Um, we have partnered with iNaturalist that um, provides species suggestions from a photo. Um, and so then you pick which species it is you're looking at based on those suggestions. And then you tell us what it's doing. Um, it's in full flower, um, but there are no leaves out yet and no fruits yet, um, something along those lines. We also have research projects. Um, we have three growing right now. One's on monarchs and milkweeds. One is um, focused on the Chicago area looking for invasive plants. And um, this one, uh, which I'll talk about today, is um, looking at um, the native R question. So you, this is something you may have been asked. Um, if you're wanting to plant a pollinator garden, I think most people recognize that native species are great in pollinator gardens, um, but we get asked the question all the time, are cultivars of natives as good as a native plant? You might get asked that too. Um, so we didn't know the answer. Um, nobody's really uh, looked at this uh, aside from a uh, graduate student in New England and a couple other folks. So we developed a project where you can grow a native plant and one or more of its cultivars and make observations on pollinator visitation. And we have a lot of reasons to wonder if cultivars will um, provide the same uh, rewards for pollinators as wild plants. So this here is columbine, a whole bunch of different cultivars of it. This is probably closest to the, the wild type that we have um, here in the Eastern US. <coughs> but you can see things like uh, flower color, flower shape. Um, in this one, uh, a doubling of petals, and that usually um, happens uh, by converting stamens to petals. Um, so these plants don't make pollen. Sometimes cultivars um, have a different scent or a more potent scent. Um, they may bloom for a longer period of time. So there are a lot of ways that they differ from wild species. And we wanna know how that affects pollinators. So here um, from one of my grad students looking at this um, same question, um, is data from Penstemon, uh, beard tongue, box of beard tongue. And um, she looked at the wild type and three different cultivars, uh, black beard, husker red, and Pocahontas. And you can see that um, Pocahontas uh, received, um, these are not st statistically different, um, these two bars, um, about the same number of pollinator visits um, as the wild type, the native species did, um, but the other two cultivars got significantly less. Uh, same thing, so that's visits per minute. Um, 
uh, when you look at the number of open flowers, you can see again that wild type and Pocahontas are most similar and that the others had fewer flowers, which may be why they were uh, less attractive to pollinators. She also looked at um, what was visiting and um, you know, you can see the key over here. Uh, and although um, we see kind of similar um, profiles across most of these groups of taxa, so here's the penstemon again. We look at black eyed Susan with four different cultivars, aromatic aster with two cultivars, and New England aster with three. Um, you can see that there are some differences. Uh, Honeybees, uh, one of our most common pollinators, really um, hitting the asters hard in the late season, um, but small bees and flies, um, bumblebees uh, visiting the, the beard tongue. So this can give you an idea if you're um, doing a pollinator garden, uh, what's, um, what plants to plant <coughs> and if, if you want to use cultivars and what you're likely to attract. One of the things that is different uh, between Black Eyed Susan cultivars that um, we don't see with our eye are the floral guides. And so you can see these with UV photography. Um, and we have a high school student who's looking at this right now, taking UV uh, or analyzing UV photos that we took last summer. Um, to understand if that's affecting uh, um, attraction of bees. So that's Budburst. And our other community science program is called Plants of Concern. Um, this program uses uh, volunteers to monitor rare plants in the Chicago region and um, more recently as of last year in Southern Illinois as well. And um, this program's goals is to engage community scientists, um, collect data on rare plant populations, look at the threats to those rare plants, um, provide that data to the landowner and manager, and monitor populations for seed collection. And 85% of the endangered and threatened um, listing changes that state of Illinois did uh, a few years ago used data from plants of concern. So this, these data are really important to understanding if um, rare plants are um, becoming more threatened or less threatened and if they should be uh, protected by the state. Uh, land managers use the data to look at population trends, help them decide what management to do. And another side effect of this program, which we didn't foresee when we started it 20 years ago, was that so many of our monitors of rare plants go on to become site stewards. Um, they get so invested in this plant that they wanna take care of the site uh, where it occurs. So here's where uh, we're monitoring in the Chicago area. Um, like I said, we expanded to Southern Illinois last year. Here are the numbers. Um, we're monitoring um, nearly 300 species, nearly a thousand volunteers um, working at a lot of sites owned by a lot of different folks. So um, super valuable data um, and data that the state relies on and is unable to um, collect themselves. So that brings me to my last point, um, which is kind of the necessity of outreach and advocacy. Uh, our community science programs are designed to um, get people looking at plants, thinking about plants, caring about plants. But if we really wanna conserve plants, um, we also need to convince uh, lawmakers that they're important. Um, we need to convince government officials that um, uh, plant conservation needs to be funded. And so uh, a few years back, we wrote a bill. Um, that was a whole new thing for me, never done that before. Um, but we wrote, um, it's called the Botany Bill for short, um, with a, a number of colleagues. 
And it's created a, a vehicle that when we go to Washington and talk to lawmakers, um, we can talk about the importance of plants, what are some of the changes that need to be seen in plant conservation. Um, we're happy to say that even though the bill itself wasn't enacted, almost all of the things we've suggested in the bill um, have been funded through um, uh, other bills, um, including um, uh, the infrastructure bill recently. Um, so this has been a really valuable experience. Um, what we try to do with the bill is to fund um, plant conservation research, to encourage students to go into botany and land management as a career, and to build a market for native plants. And so those are the aspects that we've been pushing um, in Washington to our elected officials. And I will leave you with that. Happy to answer any more questions and um, thank my, my colleagues and students and funders who, who helped all this work come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Havens, for this wonderful program. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to go through this with us. And I'd like to thank the people that are watching the program and ask you to please uh, do the uh, survey that we have that just showed up on your screen. And thanks again, everybody. <laughs>